So Digital Foundry's remit is essentially to chart the state of the art in gaming technology. And with the release of the new RTX 4000 line from Nvidia, we're facing innovation from both hardware and software. It's not just about the new Ada Lovelace Silicon, as powerful as it is. It's also about the research and development efforts being poured into supporting features. And the latest innovation is a brand new DLSS. Yes, after a shaky start, DLSS 1 evolved into DLSS 2, currently the best of the upscalers out there based on our exhaustive testing. Now, in concert with the Ada Lovelace architecture at the core of RTX 4000, we have the arrival of a new form of DLSS, augmenting the existing technology with frame generation or frame amplification, if you like. This is pioneering stuff from NVIDIA, so here's how we're going to be tackling it in this first contact video. We'll be discussing what frame generation actually is, how it makes your game smoother, and explaining how NVIDIA is achieving this on this new line of GPUs. Then we'll be showing preview benchmark data expressed as percentage differentials. You'll see the leap between native resolution rendering to DLSS 2 and then to DLSS 3. It's important to stress that you won't be seeing actual frame rates here. These are being held back until the review embargo, where you'll see fully expressed performance data, not just from us, but from the entire press. We'll also be talking about the real world applications for frame generation and why it's particularly useful for high refresh rate displays. And we'll also be describing limitations inherent to the technology and the steps that Nvidia has taken to mitigate that along with some initial data there. But more generally, DLSS 3 is a first generation take on a brand new form of temporal upscaling for games. But the concept of frame rate interpolation is nothing new. So to get some idea of how good the results are from DLSS 3, we're gonna be stacking it up against two of the most widely used FPS upscalers, the Kronos model from within uh, the Topaz Video Enhance AI software and Adobe Pixel Motion, as found within the industry standard software Adobe After Effects. So that's pretty in depth stuff. But first up, let's have a look at how the new feature actually manifests in a DLSS 3 supported game, like Marvel Spider Man, as you're seeing here, one of the three preview titles we received to take a look at. Looking at the main display features page, you can see that DLSS 3 is actually three different NVIDIA technologies that work in concert together. That starts with the DLSS 2 feature we already know about. As usual, you can choose between ultra performance, performance, balanced and quality modes. That's your AI based spatial upscaling right there. Then there's DLSS frame generation, which is a simple on off toggle. If you are running this on an older RTX 2000 or 3000 card, this will be greyed out, but with a 4000 series GPU, you're good to go. The final element, NVIDIA Reflex, a latency reduction technology. You see, unlike normal DLSS, which inherently reduces processing lag, frame generation can add to it. NVIDIA Reflex is a toggleable option without frame generation enabled, but it activates by default with frame generation active. You'll also note that VSync options are greyed out. Officially, DLSS 3 supports G-Sync on and V-Sync off only. Okay, so this is the basic outline of how the feature presents, but now let's go a little deeper on what the key DLSS 3 innovations actually are. DLSS 3's new headline technology is machine learning based frame generation. Essentially on the GPU, two sequential frames are rendered in the traditional manner. Then DLSS 3 comes in and generates a third frame in between the two traditionally rendered frames. The third frame is generated with the help of an optical flow field describing the movement of screen pixels and image features between these two traditionally rendered frames. That optical flow field is generated on a subprocessor in RTX 4000 GPUs called the Optical Flow Accelerator. This new third frame that is generated, an AI frame you might want to call it, is supposed to capture the time step or gap in between these two frames. In practice, it looks like this. On the left hand side here is Spider-Man, rendered in the traditional way, doing a jog down an alley at 60 FPS, slowed down by 50% here on YouTube. 
On YouTube, that means you're seeing one new frame of animation every two screen refreshes. At this rate, you can see the gaps in the frames as his arms swing and his legs move. It looks a bit framey and jittery. Now on the right hand side here, we have DLSS 3 frame generation, which is running at 120 FPS and also at 50% speed. On YouTube, this means you are seeing one new frame of animation with every refresh. One half of the frames you are seeing here on the right hand side of the screen with DLSS 3 are generated the classical way. The other half are AI generated frames. With both of these playing side by side next to each other, you can see how the movement of the limbs and the movement of Spider-Man's body are smoothed out in the DLSS 3 view on the right hand side. You can see how the camera movement panning over the street is also smoothed out. Even the movement of Spider-Man's shadow beneath him is smoothed out in DLSS 3's view. DLSS 3 frame generation is essentially filling the gaps of animation that are on the left hand side. Both of these recordings you are seeing left and right have the same amount of classically rendered frames in them. But DLSS 3 on the right is amplifying the frame rate with AI generated frames. You can think of DLSS 3 as a frame rate amplifier, which as you can imagine has performance considerations. Yes, performance, which at the end of the day is what this is all about. We have a build of Marvel's Spider-Man to examine along with preview builds of Portal RTX and Cyberpunk 2077. To be clear here, Cyberpunk isn't the new Overdrive version with the massively enhanced ray tracing. It has more in common with the retail game with the new DLSS 3 features integrated. For my money, ray traced Cyberpunk 2077 is one of the heaviest gaming workloads created and it's of most interest when looking at what DLSS 3 offers. It's also where I think you'll see close to the best amplification. Um, there are two tests here a circuit of the Cherry Blossom Market, which some of you may remember is part of our console test suite. Then there's a fast drive through Night City and out into the desert. The market lives up to its reputation for extremely heavy demands on the GPU, and therefore naturally, it's where we see the biggest uplifts. Moving from native 4K to DLSS performance mode, which uses AI upscaling to deliver a 4K-like image from a base 1080p render, Across this short sequence, there's a 2.58 times multiplier, rising to a 3.99 times boost, factoring in DLSS 3 frame generation. Moving on to the driving scene, the frame rate boost from DLSS 2 alone delivers a 2.42 times multiplier, rising to 3.48 times with DLSS frame generation added in. If you're wondering why the overall boost is lower in driving versus the marketplace, it's a pretty simple explanation actually due to the way percentages work essentially a higher base frame rate at native resolution has an impact on the performance uplift expressed in this way. In actual fact the driving run here with DLSS 3 is actually running at 20 frames per second faster than the market. The practical application of this is that one of the most demanding graphics workloads in gaming is super smooth and fluid on a 4k screen with Psycho RT and works nigh on flawlessly on my LG OLED CX screen. I have some limited test data up against RTX 3090 Ti, the most powerful of the consumer class Ampere based GPUs of the last generation and still a rendering powerhouse. Here in the Cherry Blossom market DLSS 2 on 3090 Ti versus DLSS 3 on RTX 4090 sees the new card offer up a 2.48 times performance multiplier with the combination of Ada Lovelace performance and DLSS 3 frame generation. Moving into our extended driving scene, that's a 2.28 times improvement with the RTX 4090 and DLSS 3. Can't talk frame rates at the moment, uh, but the practical difference of this with today's displays, well, it's very easy to express. 3090 Ti delivers a great experience on these settings for a 4K 60Hz variable refresh rate screen. The extra performance on the right there offers up far more fluid results that sit perfectly on a high refresh rate 4K VRR screen. 120Hz or 144Hz really. Marvel Spider-Man next and while we can't share our frame rate numbers well, helpfully Nvidia has already done so with a new video I saw for the first time today. Shows native resolution rendering on RTX 4090 up against DLSS 3. 
to all intents and purposes. It's kind of 100 to 120 FPS at native 4K with DLSS frame amplification, adding 100 frames per second, give or take. I mean, 200 odd FPS at 4K, pretty extreme, right? But at the same time, it's not the circa four times multiplier seen in my cyberpunk tests. Here's how things look in gameplay using one of my favorite tests, the Fisk construction site mission, where I've essentially synchronized feeds of all of the quick time events. Here, across the entirety of this sequence, on aggregate, DLSS2 is only providing a 7.4% improvement in performance, and with DLSS3 frame generation, that goes up to a straight two times multiplier. You might be seeing there that the performance boosts do vary somewhat. DLSS2 does provide more of a boost in momentarily heavy scenes. But the bottom line is that on aggregate across all of the clips, native versus DLSS3 is exactly in line with Nvidia's performance bump in its promotional video. The key there is the differential between native 4K and DLSS2. Remember, DLSS performance mode is essentially 1080p base imagery, AI upscale to 4K, so obviously we should be expecting a far higher boost than just 7.4%. Truth is, we're hitting the CPU limit. With very high RT enabled, object distance maxed, even the Core i9-12900K backed by really fast DDR5 uh, hits a performance limit. Frame amplification though is entirely on the GPU. No additional resources in generating that new frame come from the CPU. Therefore, the performance boost is essentially mitigating the CPU limit. To really emphasize this, take a look at this static shot from Times Square, where both CPU and GPU are pushed harder than pretty much anywhere else in the game. Right here, native rendering with a 4090 is still onerous at native 4K, much less so than the gameplay sequence you just saw. DLSS2 performance mode has a more meaningful 17.3% frame rate increase, which now takes us directly to the limit of the Core i9-12900K CPU. Then frame generation, CPU agnostic remember, kicks in, delivering a total 2.35 times multiplier over native and a straight two times performance boost over DLSS2. DLSS3 can therefore overcome CPU limitations to a certain extent, but the amplification factor is still beholden to the quality of CPU frame delivery. When really heavily CPU limited with a lower end chip, you'll see obvious stutter, so it's important to realize that DLSS3 can't overcome the limitations of a slowed CPU, that stutter will be amplified. Uh, finally, this one's quite exciting, the preview build of Portal RTX we had. Well, it seems to operate with some kind of borderless full screen mode, so VSync off metrics were not possible to capture. Initially, I didn't think we'd be able to make this work with our performance analysis system, which is entirely video capture based. But this scene sits within our 120 Hz capture window. Full path tracing here, a couple of portals and some water. It's a GPU heavy scene, and as you can see, we return to some big, big performance multipliers. DLSS2 delivers a 3.29 times multiplier to performance over native 4K path tracing, while DLSS3 in this scene offers up the biggest increase to frame rate yet, a 5.45 times frame rate multiplier. Now this is just one scene, so I benched the whole of Test Chamber 14 using NVIDIA FrameView, which won't be limited by a 120Hz present window. The result there sees a 3.17 times frame rate increase with DLSS2, rising to 5.29 times with DLSS3. More varied content, not always as stressful as the scene here, so the amplification factor isn't quite as extreme, but still pretty immense, I'd say. How about RTX 3090 Ti with DLSS2 versus 4090 in DLSS3? Across a minute of this scene playing out, the 4090 delivers a 2.91 times multiplier to performance. So I'm really looking forward to testing this one out on the final build, but to put it bluntly, once again, the difference between the two cards here is a good experience on a 4K 60Hz VRR display with 3090 Ti, up against an even better experience on a 4K 120Hz VRR screen with the 4090. More evidence that the higher the GPU workload, the more profound the impact of DLSS3 in improving frame rates overall.
The LSS 3s impact on performance like you just saw is very interesting from my perspective at Digital Foundry as it kind of aligns with a number of trends we are seeing in computer graphics and in computer hardware. For one, there's the trends regarding refresh rate in our monitors and televisions. In general, I think we can say that we would almost always like to have more fluid animation and more fluid frame rates in our games. So 60 FPS, 120 FPS, and even much higher. Thankfully, the display market is moving to meet that demand. We have 4K 120Hz televisions and even 500Hz 1080p screens. And soon enough, there will probably be 1000 Hz screens even. At such a high refresh rate, many problems that screens have with persistence blur and ghosting become so minuscule, they're practically not even there. That is the holy grail of motion fluidity, but driving 1000 Hz, let alone 4K at 120 Hz, requires GPUs and CPUs that can actually do that. Second, there's the trend of games becoming more visually ambitious and simulation heavy. We have things like ray tracing, path tracing, and huge crowds and cities that are going to require even more from CPUs and GPUs. I think DLSS 3 aligns rather well with these two trends. With higher frame rates, that means we can realistically drive those fast panels that are coming out or are already out, even with heavy graphical settings like ray tracing. Frame rate amplification also means we can decouple the frame rates from the CPU to a degree, as GPUs have offered nearly two times the performance increase every few years or so. CPUs have not seen that effective performance increase in quite some time, so frame rate amplification can help counteract that. And the third and last trend that I think frame rate amplification aligns with is the general trend in computer graphics to use and reuse data from multiple frames. Temporal anti-aliasing, or TAA for example, has become the de facto way to smooth and anti-alias game graphics over the last decade. Frame rate amplification works on similar principles when you think about it. Information from frames over time are used to generate a new frame. Where DLSS super resolution is generating pixels in the spatial dimension, frame generation is generating pixels in the temporal dimension. With me talking about frame rate amplification like this, it might almost sound like a magic bullet. But what exactly are the downsides? Okay, so there's a reason why the DLSS 3 feature set isn't just about frame generation. It's also about the inclusion of NVIDIA's Reflex technology, which reduces latency by optimizing the relationship between CPU and GPU. Reflex is forced on with DLSS 3 frame generation, because of the way the system works, the buffering that's being introduced. As Alex explained earlier, two frames are rendered, then an AI-generated frame slots in between. So, essentially, Reflex aims to mitigate the extra latency. Clearly important, as uh, Reflex is forced on when DLSS frame generation is enabled. But what this also means is that lower latency is also enabled for native resolution rendering and DLSS 2. I've got three sets of tests here, starting with Portal RTX, the fully path-traced rendition of the Valve Classic. We've already had a quick sneak peek at this, and we've got much more content on this one coming soon, because man, this is a beautiful game. But let's look at the latency differentials with Reflex on and off, with both native and DLSS2 rendering, then DLSS3 uh, that has Reflex locked on. Before we go any further, just to remind you that this is all pre-release preview code and there may well be latency improvements in the final games. We'll just have to wait and see there. Native rendering first. Uh, path tracing certainly isn't cheap, so performance is relatively low, leading to higher lag. Still, in this scenario, Reflex On reduces latency in the pipeline from 129 milliseconds to 95, a 34 millisecond saving. The reflex latency reduction is less pronounced with DLSS2 rendering with just a 6 millisecond reduction. But, you know, in fairness, the 4090 is so fast that the frame rate is actually very high on this title here. Finally, DLSS3 with its amplification factor places lag midway between DLSS2, reflex on and off. And yeah, 56 milliseconds there. It's essentially undetectable here comparing DLSS3 to DLSS2. And you can see from the table here that the performance multipliers are astonishing, as you saw earlier. So, job done for Reflex here in this scenario, I'd say. Next up, 
Cyberpunk 2077 in the Cherry Blossom market scene. You'll remember that this is uh, one of the most challenging gaming workloads I tested. Uh, turning on reflex in native resolution rendering, there's a massive 46 millisecond reduction in latency. With DLSS enabled, there's still a reduction, this time 9 milliseconds. In this case, however, DLSS 3 latency clocks in consistently at 54 milliseconds, an extra 12 milliseconds versus DLSS 2 reflex off. In our briefing with NVIDIA about DLSS 3, we were told there'll be a win some, lose some scenario with latency, and there it is. Regardless, you're still seeing the relationship here in this table between performance increases and the various latencies. From DLSS 2 onwards, you're still getting a far more responsive game versus native rendering. Finally, well, Marvel Spider-Man opens up another challenge for Reflex. Um, so if so much of the experience is CPU limited, optimizing the relationship between CPU and GPU can only go so far. And in fairness, the game is already running at extreme speeds at native resolution, so the potential for latency reduction will be limited. To try to open up the results, I benchmark using this scene from Feast HQ, which remarkably is extremely GPU heavy. But as you can see from the table, although DLSS 2 delivers more here, it's still some way off the results I would expect. DLSS 3 sits right between native resolution rendering with reflex on and off, but DLSS 2 does reduce latency, though again, there's little reflex can add here. Ultimately though, these figures across the board are significantly lower than the other titles because the game just runs stupendously quickly. Whichever way you play it, I don't think anyone will be complaining about input lag on this one. So that's the primary limitation of DLSS 3 frame generation, latency. So reflex is added in to mitigate the added lag, but the effectiveness at the millisecond level will vary from title to title. Nothing I've played on these preview versions was unduly impacted by variations in latency, though obviously there's a lot more testing to come. Uh, AAA titles like Cyberpunk and Marvel's Spider-Man are still highly responsive. Ultimately, the lowest possible lag is a nice thing to have on these games, obviously, but they do not define the experience. Fundamentally though, Previous performance boost techniques like DLSS 2 have come with a drop in latency and you can see that in many of the DLSS 2 results that we've just seen. DLSS 3's buffering means that you won't get that this time around. So for eSports for example DLSS 3 uh, likely won't be a good fit because you want the fastest possible response there. So I'd be sticking with DLSS 2 or native rendering for those games. Still, the mandatory inclusion of Reflex is a net win. Uh, for owners of older GeForce cards, they may not get frame generation, but they will get Reflex, which will make the games more responsive. In our prior tests, there's no reason why you shouldn't enable this. Low lag gaming, what's not to like? Another aspect of frame rate amplification that needs analysis is the actual quality of the frames produced. As I was showing earlier in this video with traditional 60 FPS on the left and DLSS 3 frame generation on the right at 120 FPS, the upgrade of motion fluidity was readily visible. In fact, I can make almost any comparison of animation and you would see very similar upgrades to motion fluidity, like just doing a basic jump in Spider-Man or a rather fast and hectic looking quick sip off of a building into the air. All of these things will look smoother with those added frames from DLSS 3. So it is doing its job, but how well is it doing its job? I think that's a hard question to answer as this is a new frontier of image analysis in video games. Based on the samples like I've been showing, I think it's doing a good enough job to be convincing. And I would say that is the first contact impression that many will have when they look at DLSS 3 in motion at a high frame rate like 120. In terms of how we analyze it though, we're still thinking that one through. One thing we can do is compare DLSS 3 to other technologies that do the same thing, such as offline frame rate amplifiers or motion interpolators. For example, here's DLSS 3 on the right hand side compared to Adobe's Pixel Motion frame rate amplifier. If you watch them play out at 120 FPS, I think they can look surprisingly similar, even at half speed here on YouTube. But I think you can notice some shimmering instability in the pixel motion view on the left hand side. And if you stop a frame, you can see why. Essentially, there's a wake-like distortion and ghosting in those parts of the image that are moving, like around Spider-Man's hands here. 
DLSS 3 does not have that. When I comb through the individual frames of this comparison, you can see the same difference between those two sides. Distortion, wake, and Adobe pixel motion, and comparatively none of that in DLSS 3's generated frames. That is mighty impressive considering it takes 125 milliseconds to generate a 4K frame here with Adobe's Pixel Motion, while DLSS 3 is presenting at 8.3 milliseconds and is generated on the GPU in 3 milliseconds, according to NVIDIA. But what about other high end offline AI motion interpolators such as Topaz Kronos, running in its higher quality slow mode, taking 750 milliseconds per frame? Just watching the sequence play out with the LSS3 and Topaz here, I think they look comparable, but once again, there are going to be some differences there when we actually take a look. If you pause a frame, you can see what I mean. Here, Spider-Man jumping out of the window again. All of those things on the screen that have an active type of movement are kind of blurred over in Topaz. I imagine many of you watching this play out earlier at half speed might not have even noticed this error. DLSS 3 does not have that error though. Advancing further into the other moments of this video sequence, we can see the same difference playing out. Left hand side with Topaz having ghosts or blurs in the generated frame while DLSS 3's generated frame has comparatively none. Some frames can look more similar like this one here with Topaz and DLSS 3, but those tend to be the frames with little relative motion. While those frames with more motion tend to have massive differences, especially with multiple planes of movement like you're seeing here. Based on such a comparison, I would say DLSS 3 has surprisingly stable motion interpolation when it's amplifying frame rates based on a comparison to Topaz Kronos or Adobe Pixel Motion. It has far less issues when you stop a frame and take a look, especially on those with complex fast motion. This is impressive once again, considering how offline frame rate amplifiers are taking hundreds of milliseconds and DLSS 3 is doing it all in, well, real time. So the quality is there in comparison to similar technologies, but what about limitations? Now, this is an area we at DF are still coming to grips with about how we judge and present the quality of AI generated frames by themselves. Much like how when DLSS 2 launched, it's gonna take a while before we come up with a good methodology to judge strengths and weaknesses. As an example of what I mean, I've noticed at moments that complex overlapping geometry can cause AI generated frames to have errors in them. Like check this sequence of frames out here, AI generated frame in the middle and the previous on the left and the following on the right. As you can see there, there's an artifact around Spider-Man's feet where it is intersecting with the railing that he is running along behind. This reminds me a bit of a disocclusion issue we might see with other reconstruction techniques actually. Essentially, we're looking at a region of the screen with disocluded pixels where there's no information there. So it's not exactly an easy scenario to generate. You could imagine though how some sort of generative AI technology such as NVIDIA Canvas could maybe aid in moments like this. Alongside disocclusion, another area where we noticed artifacting in our pre-release demo here was in HUD elements like you can see in this three-way sequence of images here, where it is either a bit faded or distorted. And when you think about it, the HUD distorting does make sense considering that HUD elements in games never have motion vectors. So this is all optical flow stuff here. Asking NVIDIA about it, they said this is something they're working on in the future, and this is still a pre-release build that we're looking at here. When DLSS 3 releases as a proper product instead of in this preview build, I'm gonna have to make decisions about how I present and explain the significance of error, which I'm not exactly sure about right now, especially how I'm going to do it on YouTube. To show you why it's challenging to talk about the significance of error, let's return to this image of Spider-Man's feet here. When I show this in a still, it's not actually how you experience it in game. It's actually only on screen for 8.3 milliseconds. And furthermore, it's preceded by a comparatively perfect frame and then followed by another comparatively perfect frame. And that's the thing. This is something I also cannot necessarily show on YouTube, how fast this is actually moving. I'm having to slow down all the footage here for you to even see these generated frames in the first place. And it's not actually representing the real screen experience at 120 hertz. Sadly, YouTube is rather behind the times here. So how much of that error is perceptible on a whole, given how quickly everything is occurring? 
I think it's going to take a while for us to figure out how to encapsulate that subjective dimension into our analysis and methodology. But in the meantime, I can definitely say, at least on first contact, that DLSS 3 typically does look like the real deal at a high frame rate. Okay, so let's move to wrap this up. We put up a trailer for this content directly after the NVIDIA keynote because we thought there'd be value in showing our real-time captures with the audience and to share some independent performance numbers right off the bat. Now, this may well be a first-generation temporal upscaler, but man, this is a milestone, right? In an age where screen resolutions are getting higher and refresh rates are scaling to remarkable levels, DLSS 3 is an exceptionally useful technology. In the wake of the trailer launching, we did get some interesting questions though, like what about frame pacing? Back in the day, using two GPUs to alternately render frames via SLI was a thing, which caused micro stutter, leading to Nvidia and AMD to take the quality of frame delivery, consistency, much more seriously. You can argue here that DLSS 3 frame generation is taking the place of that second GPU in SLI. So are frames evenly delivered? Let's go back to Cyberpunk 2077 here. No frame time numbers here, uh, but you can see consistency normalized across the three individual runs. Native may be slightly choppy at points, but you'll note that DLSS 2 and DLSS 3 play out with similar levels of consistency. So frame pacing concerns, well, there's no worries to be had here. So that's our first look at DLSS 3 and a video that turned out to be much more in depth than imagined. And as Alex said, we're still getting to grips with test methodology to showcase quality and to highlight issues. All of which is to say that obviously we've got much, much more to test once actual final software is available. But for now, that's it from me. Like and share if you enjoyed this video and subscribe to ensure you'll get to see all of our analysis content as soon as it drops. Uh, but that's all from me for now. Thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.